Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Fun Never Stops Introduction to Haskell Programming Language. My name is Paul Schultz. Um, if you guys want to blame, you know, make any complaints, this is a Twitter account where you can use it and you know, enjoy. Um, and my blog and on GitHub. Um, I work for a company, Scala C, who's actually a sponsor at DevOx UK. Uh, my colleagues are responsible for the Huntley DevOx application, if you guys know it. And we do consulting and we do training. So if you guys are interested, please talk to the guys at the Huntley booth. All right. Why we should learn Haskell? Why are you guys even here? So if you guys have been in DevOx before, you've probably seen Ted Newart's talk or any other speaker's talk about Polyglot Programmer. And you should learn different languages to be, become a better developer. It, it helps you evolve. So it's actually a good idea to learn different language. And even if you do Java or Scala or Clojure, um, learning Haskell might be beneficial. So what you would normally do when you want to learn new language is you go straight back home, open your favorite text editor, and the first thing you're going to do is probably write a, like a Hello World application. right? The problem with Haskell is that after trying you doing just that, you'll end up with this. Because Haskell isn't really that much of a hard language. It's not about syntax. Syntax is easy. It's like, I think, 12 keywords. All right? The, the problem with Haskell is the paradigm. Because Haskell is a pure functional programming language. And it's a, I know it's like a statement. But what does it really mean? Can anybody like here give me an explanation what functional programming is? Pure functional programming? Anyone? It's really hard to define. Functions are first class citizen, unlike objects are first class citizen. Yes, so that's, that's what I heard, like functions are first class citizen. So um, the things I read on the internet are basically that you shouldn't use, no, there's no assignments, no variables, once given a value, things will never change, immutability, no side effects at all. So it's always like, no, no, never, no. And I once read that a functional programmer sounds a little bit like a medieval monk, denying himself the pleasures of life in hope that it will make him more virtuous. So I hope, at least I hope, there will be a little bit more to functional programming than just this. Uh, why functional programming matters? Basically, if you think about all the presentations that you get going here at the conference, it might be about microservices, it might be about dependency injection, clean architecture, whatever. We always, the, the thing, we have the one thing in common. The things we try to solve are complex, and we always strive for modularity. This is what we are looking for, like the, the pure sense of, of you know, just dividing the complex problem into sub-problems, bringing up sub-solution, and, and, sub and merging those into final solution. And um, the thing with functional programming is that the modularity that we strive for is really, really, really easy to achieve. Because in functional programming, if there is a function that takes an input and provides an output, uh, it will always work for a given argument the same way. It's not, there is no some global state there that will be changing its, the way it works. So if, for, like, if it's going to take A and produce, let's say, 3, it's always going to be like that. Regardless if it's raining, your application is just deployed, you know, whatever the context is. Now, that output here might be actually input to a new function, which will work exactly the same way. right? And now, when you have those two, and those two you can actually very easily test. Because when you do functional programming, your test will not, your function, your unit test will not use any kind of mocking frameworks or whatever. There will be just you know, some input. I run my function with that input, and I assert a result. And once you have a ability to reason about something which is that easy, and your tests are really, really clean. You can modify your implementation. Tests are staying the same. This is just this is this pure heaven. When you have something like this and that, now you can reason about something more complex. Because you can compose a new function based on those two, and so on and so forth. So this is a really, really nice way to, to, to divide and conquer to live in a complex world, the, the complex solution that we are providing, because you can actually work from the very bottom to the very up of your, of your, of your program. Uh, so there is no such thing as concept of time. We can reason about our code with ease. Uh, 
and there's this cool thing about implementation. If, if, you, if, you, if you reason about your code just like that, sometimes writing an implementation is basically just by following times. So I have only 50 minutes to do it, uh, but there's, um, there's even like an Emacs plugin for Haskell where you basically provide a, a definition of your function, so what is the input and what would be the output, and the, and the plugin, the, the mode, will actually give you the all possible implementations that you can have. This is, just, this is better than Stack Overflow. It's just, you know, and there it is. Um, I don't have actually. Uh, I don't have time to go over all of those points, which are really interesting. But there is a paper which was written in 1988, so I was four at that time, and it, and it ex explains all that stuff with with ease. It was a really really easy paper. I understood after reading it, I think the third or fourth time. But it's really really easy, and I I, I strongly encourage you guys to read it if you haven't done it before. And the examples are in language which is similar to Haskell, so after this talk, hopefully that, that paper will be easy to read. All right, so I learned Haskell because Haskell is pure functional programming language, and I hopefully I, at least a bit I've convinced you guys that maybe this is something worth, uh, worth putting your mind to. Uh, so yeah, but you guys may be like, but there is a catch, right? There's some, there has to be something to it. If, if the syntax is easy and, and functional programming is so cool, like why is not everybody using it? What, what, what the hell? So there's a very popular comic. Um, lady is like, code written in Haskell is guaranteed to have no side effects. And the guy is, uh, because no one will never run it. Um, and that's the, that's the thing, right? If you think about it, if you have a function that you know, we will, will take some kind of input and provide some kind of output, um, then it's all cool to create a modular, readable, maintainable code. But the world is not that, that, like that, right? The world is constantly <laughs> changing. And how we can deal with uh, that kind of world, you know, scenarios where the world is changing, we have our databases, users have screen monitors and stuff like that, how, how we can use, use Haskell for it. So I have here two quotes from uh, Twitter. Uh, an interactive program is a pure function that takes the current state of the world as its argument and produces a modified world as a result. And Runar also wrote, Protip, don't try to uh, track real-world state in your code. Instead, take it as an argument, since only the world knows what the state it's in. So um, in Haskell, we kind of try to tackle this problem in a way that this is our you know, code base. This is our pure, modular, maintainable mm, heaven, right? So we have our functions here that, you know, all those little thingies, we can now reason about more complex functions when we compose those little ones. So, so we're just building slowly this bacteria here. And now there's this thin layer, which is impure. So you still have some kind of impure code. You still deal with input and output. You still have your databases or whatever. But it's really, really thin, because you push all that that, to, that, to that layer, that the complexity still exists. It, it will not disappear in your program. If you run microservices, your complexity is still there. It's just in the distributed system, not in one application. And it's here, it's still here. It's just contained in the small layer. So then as an example, uh, imagine that you have some kind of state of the world, let's say a database or whatever, and you have that current state of the world as a variable here, current state of the world. You use some, some, some method here from this, from this blue layer. And now you have your function f. You're going to call that function f with that current state as an argument. This might be your, your user you just retrieved from the database or something like that. Um, you know, internally, this will run as a, as a pure function. So given an input, it will provide some output. And that output you will get is, will be some value that you were looking for. Let's say number of projects that user has or whatever you calculated, and the new state of the world, if that world changed. Because maybe your function is actually triggering a change um, uh, in your scenario. So the last thing that you will have to do, well, you either will mo save, that, you know, save that state to the database, so modify the world. Maybe you will display some, uh, some values to the users. So there are way to, to go into that pure, impure world. But it's a thin layer, and you do it always at the very end. The very logic is pure functional. So this is cool. But you might, might be here. I'm not about for functional programming. I'm, I'm here for Haskell, so, so show us some code already. So this is what I will do. Um, quickly, Haskell is a language it's, which is, has a standard. 
different versions of a standard. There are different implementations. Uh, implementations. The probably the most well-known one is uh, GHC, Glasgow Haskell Compiler, which is also known as a glorious Haskell Compiler. And I'm not going to go through all those steps here. Basically, if you just download it, you can you can fire up REPL by just typing GHCI, and then it gives you a REPL to play around with the language. Uh, uh, you might you might uh, use this command uh, plus set t, which will uh, give you the, uh, by default the REPL will not tell you the type definitions when you type something into the REPL. If you just type this, um, it will it will do it. It will it will act by default like other REPLs are acting. All right, so functions. So let's try with something simple. A hello world. Actually, hello world can be can be done easily in Haskell. This is a function. Actually, if a function doesn't take arguments, it's called a definition. But basically, it's a function. And see how, how nice Haskell is. There is no public void whatever up front or string up front. There is no def in Scala. There is just your, your function name, equal sign, and a value. And that's all you need to have to create a simplest function that will just return a hello, a hello world string. Um, and then the one small thing, a function always, has to, always, they always has, has to start with a small letter. So this is our example in REPL. Well, we call that hello world. It gives us a string. And we see that actually a string is a list of chars. All right. So can we call a function with an argument? Actually, we can. And this is, again, very easy. It's still on just a method, name of our function, um, an argument that we're going to need, and a body. Now, you might be wondering what the u is, right? But if you look at the operator that we have over here, a string is a list of chars. That plus plus operator only acts on lists. It exists, it's defined for lists. So Haskell will infer, all right, so he has a list of chars, a string over here. He's doing some operations that require, as a second argument, yet another string. So the only thing that you will get here, the only thing that you can be, is actually a string. And you get the definition that the London is actually a function that takes the list of choice as an argument and produces a list of choice as a result. And if we call it London baby, we get the London baby. Now, there's a way for us to actually define the, type, the function signature. So line before the definition, we can actually provide the, de the definition of our function so we can say explicitly here that uh, this is a function that takes a string and, and produces a string. But it's uh, this will still compile and work. That is, uh, think of it as a, as a, the, the first line, think of it as a documentation that compiles. That, that, that's all of what it is. It's, it's mainly for readability purposes. All right. So this is just another example. It's, you know, just, it, it, you know, we have some C, and it tries to run an equals method with uh, some char. Then the C has to be char, so that type can be inferred from, from the type system, and, and it works. So can, the question would be now, all right, so we have a function with our arguments, have a function with one argument. Can we have a function with more than one argument? As it turns out, yes and no. So um, we can write something like this. So there's a function that takes the two arguments, a char and a string, and produce a string. And we can run it. So I take a, some empty uh, so underscore and some string over here, and I have, a, as a result, a word with that underscore, which is a prefix for that word. Uh, but if I look at the type signature, this looks weird, right? This is, this is, this is unusual for, for func the function definition. As it turns out, it's, a, it's actually carrying. So every function in Haskell is actually a one argument function. So if you have a function that looks like it's taking two arguments, what it does internally, it provides a function that takes the first argument as a parameter, as an argument, and it gives you, as a result, a function that will take another argument, and then will give you a final result. So if you look at it, it almost looks like a function with two arguments. But what it really is, it's a function with argument, one argument that returns a function that takes a second argument. And so this is an example. So we have a, we want to answer the I know the question for everything that can be asked in the universe, the answer is 42, if you haven't read the book. Um, we might have a complex calculation function that takes three arguments here and just doing the multiplication. So now if we look at the type definition, it's basically what it's saying is it just it takes an integer and returns a function that takes an integer that returns a function and so on. So if you read the type definition, 
you, 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 the, the parentheses are closed from the right hand side. But if you call that function, you read it as the, the application for that function is as the uh, parentheses are uh, closed from the left hand side. So you first, so if you have a complex calc 10, 20, 30, you first apply 10 to the first function that returns a new function, that, that you apply 20, that returns yet another function, that you apply 30, and that gives you the final result. All right? All right, so, there are, so we have already seen some types, like toss, integers, and builds. And booleans, uh, there are other types built in. Um, and we can, more than just those three, we can create tuples with ease. Creating a tuple is easy. You just put parentheses and provide your values, and there you go. We have a false and some is it. Then you get a tuple of a bool and a list of chars. It's going to be a double Boolean char if you provide uh, some point floating point number true and some char. Uh, there are also lists. Uh, lists always contains elements of, of, of same time, so you can only create like here a list of booleans or a list of integers or lists of strings. And you can have like a list that will contain a boolean and a string and, and something else. And uh, uh, there's a notion of such thing as a code is called a polymorphic type. So polymorphic type. If you look at a if you look at a function length that works on the list you will realize that length is uh, actually working on different kinds of lists, lists of strings, lists of integers, and so on. It would be really not wise to write an implementation of length for every other you know, type that exists there. So what length, the type signature for length is telling us that I will take a list of whatever type A here, and that A is called a type variable. So what it means, I will take a list of any type and produce an integer. So whenever you see a, a function signature that has that letter, small letter here, as a, has, so has a type variable, the overall type of that function is what we call a polymorphic type. Um, all right, so lists. So you can, you can create lists really easy. You just, you just pr you know, put the uh, square brackets and provide values into your list, and there you have it. Um, and there's a way to take an element from that list it's using the exclamation, exclamation mark uh, <laughs> operator. Uh, I, I don't know why that operator looks like this. It, it looks bizarre. Uh, for me, I think it's only because they, they want, the, the Haskell uh, committee that developed the language didn't want you to use that operator. And that's like, you know, you know, the exclamation mark is like, you really want to use it? Are you sure? Um, as it turns out, there's a null operator in, in Haskell, but it's not the null that we are, you know, accustomed to. It's not, it's not going to throw you a null pointer exception. It's, uh, it's actually a method that will tell you whether the, the list is empty or not. Uh, yeah, null. So you have nulls in Haskell. But you actually never use those two methods. You always do pattern matching. So there's a way to get a number, uh, the, the first element from the list. There's a way to get the tail of the list. The initialization, so everything beside the last element and the last element as its own. And you can drop some elements from a list and take elements from a list. So if you're using any other, you know, more sophisticated collection API, it's, it's all, all the methods that you probably are accustomed and, and, and used to using. Um, yeah. Now, there is a way to create lists in a sort of a range definition, so from one to six. That's probably what you guys see in other languages as well. But the cool thing is, you can actually provide more like a, a you can provide a skip, so you can, I can only have like uh, values which are odd, not even. So uh, I can create lists which are infinite. So I'm just saying, starting from one, go to the very end of you know the integers definition, and it will just create an infinite list. Now you might be wondering how to work with that list. Well, if you try to print that list in REPL, it will go, you know, it will start running and printing all those numbers. That's insane. But if actually I, I you know, I said like I put a, some um, definitions here, like would say like let's say numbers equals to that list, it would all work fine because Haskell is lazy evaluated, so it will not start calculating the list of its own. It will just keep the definition, keep the recipe of how that list is defined. And if you're actually going to use it, so for example, print it in the REPL, then it's going to start to try to calculate every number in that definition. But you can take five elements from it, and, and it will give you the final result. There's a, there's a method, nice method called cycle, and we're going to use that in examples in a moment. So it, you know, probably it is self-explanatory. You provide an initial list, and just it cycles that elements from that list to the very end. 
And you can also cut it as, as we did it before. Uh, there's a way to create just uh, elements with one value, and we cut it as well. And, and there's a cool feature, which is called list comprehensions. Um, so the declaration, um, if, you read, if you ever read mathematical papers, uh, the uh, probably look similar. So, so the way we read it is that we have a, we created a list which will be generated as a two to the power of x, such as this this pipe you read it as such as such as x is derived from some list. Here the list is from one to five, and it gives us the result. Now, so you you might, for example. Um, uh, the, the, the argument that you will get here uh, after this arrow is a list. So it can be any list, so it can also be an infinite list, one more time. And as I said, this will be lazy evaluated, so this definition of a list will also be lazy evaluated. So only when you will actually try to do something with that list, it will start calculating the definition. Here are, we are just taking the very first seven results. Um, you could also use more than just one variable here. So I've, I've used an X and a Y to create a list of tuples. And also, you can use those variables here that I've, I've defined an X. I can use X in definition of a second variable. So I can say like X goes from 1 to 2, but Y goes from X to 2. And this will shrink the values from the generated list. Um, there's uh, also, so, um, okay, so um, before I go into this definition, the one thing uh, I should mention, the, the, normally the functions that you call are prefix. So you provide a name of a function and then you provide an argument, right? But if you put those names in the back quotes, then you can use them as, a, as an infix operator. So I can, so for, for a readability, I'm here saying like x modular 2. So I can provide an expression. It's going to work a bit like an if statement. All right? So it will be still generating access from the list I defined here from 1 to 7, but I'm saying I'm only interested in integers which are even. There's, uh, there's also method zip, which you probably guys have seen in other languages as well. So it goes element by element from two lists and creates a, a tuples and a final result. Um, uh, but you can you can run it on infinite lists as well. Just this is just this is this visualization of how lazy evaluation works. So so string over here is a list of chars, right? Cycle from zero to one is an infinite list. But this will all work. It will it will not you know run forever. It will not try to evaluate cycle to the end of eternity. What it will do, it will take just A and the first value from here, so 0, B and 1, C and 0. And since there are no more arguments in the first list, it will just um, uh, cancel the further execution. And we have our final result. Zip width looks the same way as zip. Only thing that it does is uh, different is it takes uh, another argument, which is a function that will be run on those tuples. So think of it, it's, it runs like a zip, but it also, after those things are zipped, it will run that function on the, on the pair. So here I'm just you know, adding 1 plus 4, it should be 5, it is, and 2 plus 5 is 7, and so on. Awesome. Now classes. And you might be thinking, oh, finally, you know, something I'm used to, right? But it's not about you know, our classes that we know in from object-oriented world. It's about type classes. So type classes are a concept which, in Haskell, they are built within the language. And in languages such as Scala, you, that, 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 that notion of a type class has to be actually built on top of some other um, language syntax. In Haskell, type class is part of the language syntax. Uh, so what is a type class? If you think about type, what type really is? Type is basically a set of values, right? If you have a Boolean, and it's a set that holds value true and false. If you have integers, then basically it's a set that holds all the you know, integer values and you know, infinite number of them. So type class, it's also a set. 
but type class is a set that holds types. So what it does, a type class, when you have a type class, and I will show you examples in a second, but the, the very definition is pretty simple. Type class gives you some methods, defines some methods by name and a signature, and is saying, listen type, if you want to be a member of my club, that's OK, but you have to provide a body to those functions. Here is the application form, right? Here are some definitions, and you have to provide implementation for that function, for, for those functions. And if, that, if there exists um, that definition, so we call it a type class instance, so if there is an instance for, for that type, defined for that type class, we say that this type is a member of the type class. So this might sound weird, here is an example. So there's a simple type class which is called equals. And equals defines some methods like you know, equal sign and not equal and, and, and well, pretty much it. And um, an order provides a, a ability to see which, which type is bigger or smaller. There's a show which takes a type and produces a string. And there's a read that for even string will produce um, uh, that type. So let's see how that works. So <coughs> integers in Haskell, they are already already members of the equal type, si uh, type class. They are the members because they, they are defined as members of the type class in the language. So that's why, because they are the members of the type class equals, they can use the equals equals sign. If you create your, create your own type and you want to use that equals equal sign, we will have to make that type a member of the equal, uh, of the equal type class. The same goes with, so Boolean is, for example, the member of uh, order type class. You can run, um, so here I'm calling show method on integer. And since integers are also members of uh, show type class, you know, this will produce a string. This will produce a string representing that integer and we concatenate it with a, another string. And the read, as you remember, takes a string and provides us a, 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 a type that we are interested in. So we provide a string, and read that string will give us the integer. So it's going to be like 5 plus 10, and it will give us 15. Now, if we run it just like that, if we run it, read and provide <coughs> string 5, the Haskell will, you know, will say, like, I'm not happy. The compiler will say, I cannot compile it. Why? Because as you remember, read method takes a string, and, but it's, it's a polymorphic type. It provides something of type A. Here, it could derive that information. The type was inferred from, because it was, so whatever was actually calculated here had to be running with an integer, right? So whatever we had over here had to be an integer, so it knew that this, the, the A in the type signature is going to be an integer. But here, we, just, we are not providing that information. So he will complain, I'm not happy. What we can do, we can explicitly say uh, what type are we are interested in, and it will work just fine. So um, yeah, so in, when you have a type classes, uh, now there's a, there's a trick that we can use, which is called a class constraint. So class constraint use, so type classes are like basic concept in Haskell. They are, they are used all the time, and you, you will see it in a second. So here, I have a function that takes two arguments, and, and B, A, A and B, and sums them together. Now the question would be, what is the type of that function, right? Is it an integer? Well, maybe, but why not double, or float, or any other number that we have in a type system? Why not? Or maybe why not strings? Concatenate strings together, right? So the type definition that we're going to get is using something we call a class constraint. And class constraint is using type classes. So class constraint is this thing over here. So we are saying this is a function that takes two arguments of whatever type A and gives us as final result a type of uh, something of a type A. However, A cannot be everything. A can only be a type that is a member of a type class num. So there is a type class num, which defines the functions like plus and minus and divide and so on. And you can run that function 
for any value whose type is a member of that type class. And it might be an integer, uh, it might be a double, and so on. So now here, if I have this weirdo function you know, that takes some weird arguments, and here it you know, adds two, and here divides by some double, and, and here concatenates with some string, Haskell will infer that information, and it will see, all right, so this is a, this is a function that takes something of type t and t t1, and, and a list of integers, and produce a tuple of those types. And what are t1 and t2? Anything, as long t1 is a member of type class number, so it can be any number, and t1 is a type class of, uh, uh, is a member of type class fractional, which basically is a type class that takes all the floats and doubles and, and so on. All right? Sorry. Yes? So if, you, if you just wrote a, a add a, b. Yes. There is no default type. So this is, this is the definition. I, I just did it, right? A plus B. This is that's the def, that's a type definition of a function. Is that inferred or is that did you defer? Uh, that's inferred. I mean, I can, um, if, if, OK, if I run right now, I can, how much time? We've had 20 minutes. Plenty of time. Um, so yeah, all right. Um, in a sec. <coughs> Uh, give it a sec. Oh no. Okay, that's good. So if I say at a b equals a plus b, right? Like that. Uh, well, uh, sorry. Uh, if you um, apologize, so I, I should probably set it. If you so that all all the definitions that you guys saw is they will work on a, in a source code. If you run in a repo, you have to provide this uh, let instruction at the very beginning. All right, so we have our add defined. And now if I say, what is a type of add, you'll get that information. So Haskell, so in the, sorry. So uh, here, I, I've put that definition explicitly but it was just for readability in the slides. I could, I could delete that, that first line, and Haskell would infer that, that, that type definition. Because of, because of the class. Yes, because, all right, so it, it, it goes like this. Great. Uh, this guy is giving me some A and Bs. For me, it can be anything. But wait, he's using a plus. Where do I have a plus defined? Well, I have it defined in type class called num. So, those guys can only be, it will all work if those guys actually are members of that type class num. Uh, this, okay, so in a second, we're gonna create our own types, and we're gonna create our own type classes, and we're gonna create for those classes our own methods. So maybe this will be uh, more easier to, to, to comprehend. But the, the idea is general, you don't really have to think in Haskell. Haskell will think for you, uh, Skynet sort of way. Um, it, uh, the thing is that, it will just look at the, the body definition, and it will try to infer your types. And it will try to be as generic as possible. And so, so, so this, uh, this A and B here, the polymorphic type, is like generics in Java, right? This is exactly the same thing. But, but Haskell has tried to be as smart as possible, and then he, he will try to provide as more generic type definition as it can get. If it was just, you know, if we that got provided a definition like, um, so if we did something like, you guys see it from the back. Yeah. Uh, if, we, if we do um, let something a equals a, and we're going to try to see the type of something, then Haskell will tell you, well, this is a function that takes something of type t and, and gives you a t. And it will not care what a t is. It can be any type, string, integer, your, whatever type that you defined. But once we did some operations on the, all those values, that, so, um, so just to be clear, the difference, so we had, before we had uh, add, which is a, b, and uh, there was a plus, but we can create, we can create add, uh, add two, which will not be really an add method, 
it will just create a tuple of those values that we provide in, as an arguments. So one more type, the type of add is constrained by the type class, and type of add to is not constrained. So that here is the difference. Add to was just creating a tuple. So it still can be, those two can be different types. So we have t and t1 because a might be a string and b might be an integer. So Haskell infers that information that a and b actually might be something completely different. But we don't really do anything with those types, with those values, right? We just return them in the, in the container, in a tuple. So the, the, the constraints that you're going to get on the function definition are, are plain simple. However, if we do something more complex with it, like, for example, try to add them, then Haskell is going to be like, huh, it cannot be really that generic. It has to be a type that will understand a plus operator. And I see plus defined in a type class num. So I will constrain the types. I will say this function add can only be run for any type that is in a num type class. Yes? Sorry, what if we define our own type? Yes. This plus operator. Uh, so uh, it, will, it will try to keep it. So um, we can actually do it in a second if you want. Okay. Yeah, we will go to define our own type class, and then we can go back here and just see how it works. I have 50 minutes, so just in order to finish the slides, can we do it at the very end? Is that okay? All right. So, yeah. Um, okay, so um, now 15, 40 minutes. All right, so uh, I'll try to go quick, quicker. So there's a, we try to implement the length method for list, which takes uh, any list of type A, and uh, sorry, it's always supposed to be returns an integer. Uh, never do changes to your slides 15, 15 minutes before the presentation. So, so here, the type definition would be an integer, because we either return 0 or, or, or whatever value. And um, the if statement is pretty plain simple, right? If, if the list is empty, then return 0, else plus 1 and the length to the tail of that list. But you will hardly ever see uh, if statements in Haskell. Why? Because you can use uh, something uh, which is a bit more uh, so would say informative which is at, uh, called uh, pattern matching. And if you guys ever did, ever did Scala, for example, you might be uh, aware of that uh, functionality. But here it's really, really nice, because the way that we do uh, pattern matching in Haskell, when we, we, we use pattern matching in functions definitions, we provide uh, the patterns in a separate lines. So what we are saying here is that length is a, is, a, is a function that will take a list of integers and will, uh, sorry, a list of any type a's and returns an integer, right? And definition goes like this. If the length will get an empty list, the value is 0. If the length will take a list that looks like there's a head and some tail, then we're going to call 1 plus the length of that tail. So uh, when I first saw, saw that, I was like, what is it? Is it like f two different functions? No, it's still one definition. It's still one definition of a single function, but we provide the bodies for different patterns in separate lines. And, you, and if you create like more complex functions in Haskell, this is pretty neat, because you see the definition of some complex function and you, have, you try to reason about it, you have some error, or something is not working, you try to reason about your code, you, you see the definition, you go just to the line that describes your current scenario, your current argument. Let's say, for example, no, not, not an empty list, some list that at least has well, at least one element, and then you can just, you know, just, just focus on the body of that definition. You don't, you don't care about other uh, lines. Yes? Uh, yes, it will work on infinite list, but if you try to run length on infinite list, it will go, it will go forever. I don't know what you mean by. So now, for example, I could say um, if it is an infinite list, I would return minus one. So is there a pattern matching that says, oh, it's an infinite list? I don't know if we, so because infinite list is basically built like a linked list. So so list definition is is you have your element. So that's one thing, the first element of the list. And the second argument is the rest of the list, the tail, right? 
So this is what you, so this is what you can do. So you, go, you will get that information. So you, you cannot actually understand what's next, because what, to see what's next, what that XS is, if it's still some other list or maybe an empty list, you have to go recursively till the very end. So I don't think that you can, from pattern matching, derive the information whether the list is infinite or not. But it shouldn't be really a problem, because you don't, if you do Haskell, you don't really care about whether this, because you, you, you sort of live in this environment where everything is lazy evaluated. It's going to be run when it's actually need, needed. So if we had that if statement as well, and if, and if, um, and if you, for example, had a, a, like a Boolean expression in that if, if something, and you have something and something else, and if that first, second function will, okay, makes not, not, not like a good example. But basically, you are, you are, you live in a world where everything is lazy evaluated, so you don't really, you don't really care ab about it that much. You, you just know that this, this, if you run length on infinite list, it will, it will just, you know, run for, for eternity because you're trying to calculate something that is infinite. Um, I don't know if you guys heard this story. Uh, there was a company in the 90s, uh, the management, they thought it was going to be a good idea to evaluate developers. Um, oh, sorry, it's uh, not here. So pattern matching for, for concrete values as well. Uh, you can do like, you know, if programming is Java, good, Haskell, even better, add a language eh? Um and you can do pattern matching, uh, pattern matching here from, uh, so you, you, I'm just saying that I'm not really, so I have a tuple from some values, and I pattern match against that tuple, but I'm not really interested in the, in the first and the second, that can be anything. I'm only interested in the value uh, y, because I want to return a, a second value from the tuple. I could provide here also an x and a z, but since I don't use them here in the definition, I can just use underscore, just pointing to the, somebody that will read my, my code in six months that we are not really using those two values. We're only interested in the, in the second one. And that was that's my story from the 90s. That company had a management, management and they want to evaluate the developers. And the idea was simple. The, the developers were supposed to, were, were received a mail on Monday and were supposed to um, contribute a report at the very end of the day saying how much lines they added to the code base. The sad thing was that that very that day, then the thing, the evaluation started, the, the, the main developer, like the senior developer, the management knew this is the guy we need to have in our team because everything will collapse if, you know, if he leaves the company. That day before, he was actually doing some refactoring, and, and he, the, his first report was, I deleted 2,000 lines. So they, they, they understood this is really not a good idea. But let's imagine that we live in that company and we have to implement that method. So, um, so we have a method that takes... Um, uh, a number and provides a, a ranking. So it will give you an, a number of lines that we provided, and it will give you a rank. So, so we could do pattern matching, but there is also other way to do pattern matching, and it's uh, it's called guards. I'm in London, so I added this slide. Uh, so this this works differently. So there's no longer an equal sign here. We will have this pipe stating different different pattern matchings. But what we are doing is we always evaluate a Boolean expression here. So we are saying, you know, if lines are bigger than 100, then senior developer. If between 30 and 100, then the regular. If between 0 and 30, then junior. And you know, if minus 0, then uh, less than 0, then you, you know, you're a hacker. Congratulations. Um, the developers were confused because they didn't know how to evaluate lines. So we added the three arguments, added, deleted, and modified lines from, so they can provide that information from Git repository. But here, we are not using added, deleted, and modified. We still keep that definition. So you might be wondering what the lines are, right? Because here we had that as an argument. Now here we have three different arguments. So where that, is, where that com comes from. And we can provide something which is a, like a where clause that defines what lines are. So if you ever uh, written anything in Scala, you have a function, right? And that function, you want to use some, some inner function in it, right? You, you, you might be doing like a private function in this, the same hierarchy, but since that, that private function is going to be used only in this function over here, normally what you do is you define that in the body of that function. And this is a bit crappy, because you have the, the main function. You want to read what that function does, but then first you have to go through that definition of that inner function. 
then at the very end you have the body of your own function, so the thing you are really interested in. And it's, uh, from the readability point of view, this is a bit messed up. Here, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a lot nicer, because you have a, I have a method here, function rank, rank me, and th there's a body I can read and reason about, and if I don't know what lines are, or any other private method that could be defined here, I just go uh, to the very end and I have that definition. For me, it's just uh, a little bit more maintainable. Okay, six minutes, so I have to move on quickly. So we can create types by basically aliasing, so I think that's self-explanatory, uh, I can move on. And we can create something which is called uh, data declarations. So we here create a new type, which we call operating system. This is a type declaration, and we are using different data constructors. So we are saying this type can be either Windows, OS X, Linux, and Unix. And now we can create a method for it, boot, which will take something of a type operating system and create some kind of string. So for example, if it's a Unix, so we're going to do pattern matching here. If it's a Unix, then I'm up and running. If Linux, when I was actually never stopped. If OS X, not sufficient, you know, Starbucks coffee. And with Windows, upgrading to Windows 10, just please hold. Now, we could create a type class, which would be called bootable. So this is the type class definition. And we are saying, check this out. There's a, there's a type class bootable, which will have a method boot, which will take a type of uh, some kind type A, which will be a member of the type class, and will return that string. And now we can create an instance of that type class for our type operating system. And we pulled all that definition we just saw before in that, in that def definition here. So now, um, OK, so if there was another method that would be taking some kind of type that is a and um, a member of type class bootable, we could just provide our operating system. So this is how we create. I'm sorry I'm stacking click quicker, but I have four minutes, so I have to run faster. So now we could you know, create instance for equals uh, type class as well, right? It would be plain simple. Um, and we'll just work. We could create one for show. We could create one for, for any other of those type classes. But there is a trick. You can actually use uh, keyword deriving. And we are saying create. In the type, type definition, create also instances for those to, four type classes that we have defined in the language. And the way it works is that you know it compares just the names of those types, so it will know that Windows is not Unix. Uh, it will it will know how to create a string for Windows. Will will read the type from from string, and it will the order type class will be taken from the order of uh, the, the way you've defined values in that type. So if you move the windows from here, then do it. If you, if you move the windows from the beginning till the very end, then this would return false. Um, and there's also a way to create uh, data constructors with some values. So for example, the, we, have a, we have a shape type. And now we are saying this can be a circle. And a circle is a constructor that will take a, some kind of integer. Or it can be a rectangle that will take um, to floats, uh, sorry, a circle of a float and, and rectangle would take two, two floats. So it will create your type. Uh, uh, so if you, if you create an instance of that type, you just add some additional information, like for example here, circle and, and, and radius is, is 10. Uh, and quickly, three minutes, we can do it. Quick sort. Unix goes to quick sort. The very easiest definition that you get is if you, if, you, if you try to explain it to somebody who's not into IT, it basically goes like this. Is the if the list is empty, you return an empty list, right? If it's not, you take the first element, you put it in the middle, and you take every, every other element in the list, and everything that is smaller, you put it on the left, and you do a quick sort on it. Everything that is bigger from X, you put it on the right, and, and do a quick sort on it as well, right? That's the definition of the most basic stupid quick sort implementation. And, and I'll just in two minutes, I'll try to guys show you how expressive language Haskell can be. So this is the definition of a quick sort in, in Haskell. This is exactly what I just said in a second ago. Uh, if it's an empty list, return an empty list. If it's a list that has a, some element and a tail, then put that element in the middle, take everything else that is smaller and run quick sort on it, and take everything that's larger and run a quick sort on it as well. What does it mean to be smaller? Where it's an every a from tail that is smaller or equal to x, and larger that's everything from tail that is just basically larger than x, and it just works. Now, you guys been in recruitment processes before, right? 
You, you've seen fizz bus. It's how, how, you guys haven't seen it. It goes like you go from one to infinity if the number is divided by three. You put fizz if by five bus, and if it's divided by three and five, then you could put fizz bus. And you suffered probably in the job interviews. Now you can actually do it a lot easier in Haskell. And this is, just, this is like for me, this is the, the, the pure expressiveness of the language. So we create a pattern here. So we're saying fizzes are basically happen every other third. Uh, third occurrence and basis will have every other fifth, right? So now we can uh, create a pattern. The pattern will will be will zip physis and basis together. So what we will so if you try to read that pattern over here, I'm taking only the first 16 elements from it. It's empty, empty fizz, empty bus, and so on. And at some point there's a fizz bus here. And now to have our final result, all we have to do is we have to combine that pattern with an infinite list of integers. When work, what combine is? Well, if, if the element of, of the list is an empty word, then just return a number. If it's not empty, then return that word. And you have FizzBus, and it, it works. And if the uh, recruiter will tell you now, Provide me a bar which will happen every 17th element. What will you do is you will just add one more pattern, zip it, and it works. Um, I don't have time for questions. However, I'm going to be around. So if, if you guys have any questions, please come. The, 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 the person who asked about the operator, we can try it in a second. But I'll, I'll just have to leave the room for the next speaker. Thank you very much.